First, I'd like to emphasize the fact that when I was first asked to participate this in the role of a legal advisor, I was um, really excited about the fact that this was going to be a report written by war fighting commanders on the challenges associated with fighting these type of hybrid enemies. And one of those challenges is uh, the function and role of the law in this fight. And I think that's an important point to start out with, that ultimately this is the domain of commanders, not necessarily lawyers. Lawyers contribute uh, by, by guiding commanders to complex legal questions, but ultimately what we're talking about here is the application of national combat power to achieve a strategic objective, and that's war, and war is the business of war fighters. And this report, I think, does a remarkable job of highlighting how when, when you confront an enemy who views your compliance with the law or your commitment to comply with the law as a tactical and strategic enabler for its own objectives, that it creates an immense challenge in compliance. A couple of points I want to highlight that are reflected in the report and I think are going to be reflected in many of the comments. The first is that this, this, this domain of images related to conflict has in many ways distorted the proper understanding of the law. There's a perception that the law of armed conflict, the historic body of international law that regulates the conduct of hostilities in war, somehow imposes on military commanders an obligation to prevent civilian casualties. In fact, what it imposes on commanders is an obligation to mitigate risk through feasible measures designed for that purpose. And in that regard, I think one of the points that the report highlights, which has been unfortunately lost on the wi in the wider discourse, is that process matters. The process of making an effort to comply with the law is an indication of the good faith commitment to the law by the parties to the conflict. And on that score, the outcome seems relatively clear. There is evidence reflected in the report of two sides to a conflict, one side making significant effort, sometimes beyond what's required by the law, to mitigate the risk to civilian populations, and the other side actually trying to increase the risk to the civilian population in order to gain a strategic advantage in the international uh, public domain and a tactical advantage by making it more difficult for their enemy to employ their power to bring about uh, the objective they seek to achieve. So I think the most important legal aspect of the report is that the law has to be properly understood, properly analyzed, and properly explained, or else it will have a distorting effect on the function of military force, which is to bring about the prompt submission of the enemy. War is not supposed to be a fair fight. Nations unleash their military power in order to achieve objectives efficiently and effectively within the framework of the law. Now the report also indicates the very significant efforts that the members of the, of the commission were able to observe and assess on the part of the IDF to implement the law in good faith. Beginning with training, going through the deliberate targeting process, and even in the time sensitive attack decisions, making efforts to mitigate the risk to the civilian population. And that leads to another important aspect of this discourse. The question that should be asked when there are civilian casualties in war is not what caused them. What causes civilian casualties in war is combat, and combat in proximity to civilians. And as General <coughs> Devereaux indicated, the reality is that that's the most likely scenario that US military forces and many other military forces are going to confront in the coming decades is having to engage in combat with enemies in densely populated areas. The real question is not causation, it's responsibility. If there are civilian casualties, destruction of civilian property, and civilian suffering in general, if it was unnecessary, who bears responsibility for that unnecessary suffering? And that is going to be dictated by looking at compliance or non-compliance with the law. So on one side where you have efforts to warn, to evacuate, to select timing of attack and weapons for the use in attack 
that mitigate the risk of the civilian population. And you're trying to do this in an environment where the enemy is deliberately locating its most vital assets at the most protected civilian sites. It reveals to you where responsibility should be allocated for the consequence of those attacks. And, and focusing on responsibility instead of just general causation will, will have a positive effect on assessing compliance with the law. Because compliance with the law, particularly in the conduct of hostilities, has to be assessed based on what decision makers knew at the time they made their decision. It cannot be effects-based condemnation. But if you think of the media reporting largely related to the conflict in Gaza and other conflicts recently, that tends to be the instinct. Look at the effects of combat and automatically extrapolate back that if there were civilian casualties, the, con the, the conduct must have been unlawful. That's a distortion. It's an unrealistic standard to demand of military commanders. Military commanders should be expected to do their best under the circumstances to feasibly mitigate risk, but they can't prevent it. So if we focus on what the law really demands, which is good faith efforts to mitigate risk, and we look to the processes that armed forces and commanders use to achieve that objective, it gives us a better touchstone of compliance with what the international community has established is the standard of legitimacy and legality of war. And one final point that's very important that's reflected in the report is the danger associated with being um, imprecise in understanding the difference between legal obligations and policy constraints. 